Hello and welcome to our first online webinar here at Cyrus Consultant. Today we can give you a short introduction in our Cyrus GIP analysis. First of all, before I start, I would like to thank you for all the yeah, participants we have here in the, in the round, as well as all the questions that were asked before. Of course, we cannot touch all of them today in this very short and time lim limited session. But of course, feel free to ask further questions in the chat during my speech or contact me as well after our 30 minutes today. So to start with a short introduction from my side. My name is Manu Sandler. I'm working here at Cyrus Consulting as associate partner and leading a team of around 20, 25 consultants in the area of cybersecurity. Here at Cyrus, as the name says it, we are doing consultancy in different levels for cybersecurity, as well as teaching people in our academy on different levels. And we ensure for you and your clients compliance to the standards by performing audits and assessments. So maybe some of you get in contact with us with our almost famous pocket guide. So we are very proud to send already more than 600 units all around over the world to any kind of different clients. So maybe that was also the point where you get in contact with us. But apart from the pocket guide, we have also further offers around the ISO SAE 21434, which is first of all, our cybersecurity virtual live training. So one day starting training for everyone who needs to identify risks and is affected with cybersecurity in the daily work as well as our brand new cybersecurity book. So more than 400 pages content about the new standard and how to implement that in the daily work. Apart from that, we also developed our so-called competence framework to provide the right level of knowledge for the right people, since in the end, not everybody needs to know the same thing about cybersecurity. Just compare a project lead or project manager with a software developer. And last but not least, our cybersecurity gap analysis. And that's exactly where we want to go today a bit deeper to give you the background, why we developed it, and actually what it is and what is the benefit of it. But before starting with that, I have a short question here in the round, just to get a feeling, which standards and regulations related to cybersecurity do you already know? So maybe give me some some hints in the chat. What have you heard about, or with which standards, which regulations with cybersecurity were you already in contact? Just type a short message in the chat so that we get a see a feeling. Okay, how many people have heard the twenty one four three four or even others? Well, let's give me a few seconds. All right, so as, as assumed, I got some notes already for the 21434, and actually that is the most known and the most common standard at the moment, and of course the most discussed. And yeah, it's getting more and more known, more and more popular, but still it's a new thing in the industry. So let's have a short look on the respective timeline of it. So it all started around end of 2016, where this standardization group came the first time together and with different steps of development until I think it was February in 2020, when the first version was officially released. And I assume that was also the point in time where most of you got in contact with that and where it was spread out to all companies around the world. And people get more and more attention to cybersecurity. And this year in Q3, planning Q3, there will be the official release of that standard. So that standard then needs to apply for all new projects. And of course, 
Q3 2021, if we look where are we today, it's not that much time left. And it's not much time left to prepare for that and yeah, to change the daily work, to be compliant and to develop secure products in the future. But let's stay again one more minute to educate everybody on the same page on the 21434. And let's have a look in an overview of its content. So it's all in all split into 15 chapters. And the first technical one is chapter five, which starts with the cybersecurity management on organizational level to give or to provide requirements what an organization needs to do to enable projects to work compliant to the standard to develop secure products. Then, of course, management is not only on organizational level, it's also on project level, which is reflected in the clause six for the project dependent cybersecurity management. So the different cybersecurity activities that need to be applied on project level. Then we have a chapter seven about the continuous cybersecurity activities. So there are different activities that need to be done all the time during the development and also when the product is in the field. In chapter eight, it's about the risk assessment methods or also known as the so-called TARA, so the threat analysis and risk assessment to identify the technical risks related to cybersecurity in a product. Then the standard goes more in the development phase, so starting with the concept phase, defining the cybersecurity goals, deriving a concept, and going afterwards into the development, so on the left side of the V and the right side of the V, including the validation. And after, of course, the development phase, comes the production, operation, and decommissioning, or also summarized the post-development phase. And the standard closes then with chapter 15, the distributed development, to define how customer and supplier need to work together. So as you see on the right side, there are, and at the moment, visit this version, more than 140 new requirements, recommendations, and permissions that need to be fulfilled to be compliant to the standard. And on the one hand, we have the 21434. That's known to everybody, but cybersecurity needs more. And that is a common misunderstanding or something not everybody is aware. So we have here a short sketch of different, yeah, different standards and regulations related to cybersecurity. Maybe some of you are already heard uh, which we can see in the middle, the SAE J3061, which was the first document or the first uh, standard or regulation, or actually it was a guideline for cybersecurity in the automotive industry, which will be obsolete then once the 21434 is published. But we also have things like the ISO PASS 5112, which defines how a cybersecurity audit related to the 21434 needs to be executed. We have the UNR 155, so I will also touch that later, a new regulation from the UNEC related to cybersecurity, and also a brand new, the cybersecurity extension for automotive spies. And there are further standards related to cybersecurity, which can and need to be taken into account, like the ISO 27K or the TSACs in the automotive context, the 62443 for industrial security, or even the 26262, which I assume most of you already know from functional safety, where also parallels and synergies are to the new 21434. So you see, it's not just the one standard we need to take into account. It's a whole, yeah, a whole system, a whole combination of different standards and regulations that become important at the, mo at the moment and also for the next time. And different standards, different regulations means and also different kind of proving the compliance to it, different kind of audits and different kind of assessments. And also here, I have a short question to the round, also to get a feeling how much people already have had a cyber or take part of a cybersecurity audit or assessment. 
or in other words, who already passed one, who already knows what to do to pass it. So usually on your screen, there should be now, ah, and I think it works, there should be now um, a short poll. So who of you already passed the cybersecurity audit and assessment? And we see a clear, oh, I have some yes, that's great. So that's you, one of the rare people. But I think we already saw, yeah, a trend here. So it's around 80% who never passed or never had a cybersecurity audit and assessment already. So which means this is a brand new thing for almost all of us. We do not exactly know how to prepare for it and how to pass it. So what needs to be done? What is the expectation? What is also the right interpretation of the standard? And also, I mentioned the UNR regulation. So there are also different kind of audits and assessments. And that's also something I would like to touch a bit deeper. Because on the one hand, we have the 21434 with a cybersecurity audit and a cybersecurity assessment. But on the other side, there will be the UNR 155, the regulation for a cybersecurity management system. So we have the 21434, our new standard, cybersecurity in the automotive. To prove compliance to this standard, or be more precise, to prove that the organization processes are compliant, there's currently the so-called ISO PASS 1552 under development, which provides a specification how to perform audits for the 21434. On the other side, we also have the UNR 155, the newer regulation from the UNICE for cybersecurity. And maybe some of you already heard that. There's also from the VDA uh, a book, um, yeah, a book, a standard for evaluating or for assessing an automotive cybersecurity management system. So we have four different kinds of documents and from different point of views. And in the end, they are all related to each other. So the 21434 uses the 1552 being audited. The UNR 155 refers to the 21434. But on the other side, if you fulfill the standard, the 21434, you also be able to fulfill the regulation for the UNECE. And the VDA book helps you and contains the minimum requirements to be able to fulfill the UNEC regulation. So there are, again here, different documents we need to take into account to be able to be compliant in the future. So we have different kinds of audits and assessments, but why they are really important. And there are different reasons why we should not only take that into account, we must take that into account in future. So that's, on the one hand, the UNR 155, of course, it's only a regulation. Yeah, but that now also changes. It was adopted to be an European law beginning of this year. So it's not just a regulation anymore, it's really a law. And a law everybody has to fulfill. In addition to that, if you're not able to be compliant to the UNR, there will be a sales ban for all yeah, affected car manufacturers, which covers then more than 50, uh, 54 countries and more than 32 million cars per year, which will be affected. And as you can see, it's mainly Europe, but even some more countries. And for the US and the Chinese market, there are similar regulations under development. But it's not only from the law and the standard point of view, so it's also regarding product liability. According to the European product liability law, individuals can be responsible if people get harmed due to missing compliance to state of the art. And of course, no product should go into production if you don't have an argument that your product is secure, provided by a cybersecurity case. 
And the one of you who are involved in work with car manufacturers know how expensive it is to shift a start of production date. And last but not least, what we already see that first manufacturers require penalty fees from their supplier in, in, kind, um, in case of lack of processes or um, yeah, assessments and audits which were not passed. So there are also there are different reasons why an assessment and audit should be taken serious, but actually how to get there. And that's one thing we want to provide and where we want to provide help. Usually you have a current state, you might have a missing definition of processes, and you have a limited time until the new regulations and standard will be in place. But in some way, you need to provide a bridge, you need to find the right steps to get to your desired state, meaning to have all gaps identified and to know where the strength and where you have to improve, your, improve yourself. And let me illustrate that in a bit of a clear way, what we mean here. So our, uh, our target is a desired state at the start of production. And we all know automotive industry means limited time and limited resources. And we need to be compliant with all these new automotive cybersecurity standards. And the first question, and that is also what we're seeing from all of our clients, is where we are today. Are we already quite close to our compliance target? Are we maybe somewhere here? Or are we really in the bottom because cybersecurity did not play a role before in the company? So one question is where we are today. But it's not only the question where we are today, it's also the question which direction are we going? Maybe cybersecurity is not taken serious enough and we are moving away from our target of compliance. Or another possibility, the company invests way too much and takes everything really not in an efficient way, spending too much effort and doesn't get the results. So maybe they also over-engineer. The typical thing every German engineer uh, yeah, gets blamed. Or maybe you're already on the right way. So have the, the right measures, the right steps identified to reach your target. And that's one of the goals for us to see, okay, where you are today and which direction do you go and which direction do you need to go? And here it's important to do that right in time. If you do your compliance check, maybe here a few months before start of production, yeah, then it might be difficult or impossible to reach your final target in the end. So to know where you are right in time and the best case today, to have enough time to find the right way to the level of compliance to reach to the desired state you need in your context. And actually, this is also not that easy because different teams and different parties are uh, involved and are affected by that. So on the one hand, it concerns the whole organization to build the right processes, the right rules, the right templates, having the right competence awareness, but also the project to coordinate in your dedicated project on the development of a product, the right activities, and of course the whole engineering path to make the product secure, identify the risk, derive requirements, and implement them in the end. So it depends where you are, and it's sometimes not that clear, but if some of these words sound familiar to you, the process, the roads, the cybersecurity culture, also the tool management, how to make your tools secure, all the whole big piece or topic, all the post-development to have an aligned way of working once incidences are happening in the field. So then it's your focus should be on the organizational cybersecurity management. But if 
more cybersecurity plan, the cybersecurity schedule, or the DIA is a new word for you in that uh, context, or you need to ensure that you have a complete cybersecurity case, or even the connection to the production by establishing a production, production control plan, or defining a VNV strategy for cybersecurity with your test department, then the project dependent cybersecurity management might more in, be in your scope. And last but not least, if you need to create an item definition for cybersecurity, writing requirements, performing the cybersecurity risk assessment, so the so called CHARA, or deriving a concept, uh, then the engineering part. It's more in your focus. So, in the end, to reach complete compliance, also what we saw here, different areas are affected. And of course, it depends on the organization, it depends on the context and the pro yeah, on the context of the projects, the circumstances where you're working. If you maybe you take need to take the organization more into account, or maybe the engineering is more important. Or what we see in many projects, from a technical point of view, things are working, the organization has first processes, but actually cybersecurity is not related in, or not represented in the project. So maybe then this is one starting point. And based on that, we identified these three different main areas to start to see, okay, where do we need to add things? Where are missing gaps? Where are things working good or working bad. So actually, with that approach, we want to fulfill, on the one hand, uh, compliance or provide a status regarding and actions regarding compliance to 21434, which of course is the main input, the, gives the main direction for cybersecurity in future, but also as well the UNR 155, where the requirements might be more general, but the consequences are more serious, if you think about the sales ban again. But it's not only these both topics, but we also see the last years that the leading car manufacturers, so really the big ones, come up with more and more own cybersecurity requirements, which are not in scope of the 21434 or the UNR 155, but they need to be fulfilled. And one thing you can observe is that also the manufacturers talking to each other and requirements are overtaken. So also that needs to be taken into account and needs to be on the pipeline to bring your product in the field and to get the, the right feedback and the right trust of your customers. And you saw the different standards and the regulations. There are also more things more standards and also further best practices that need to be taken into account, starting from the 5112, uh, the 24089 for the software update management systems, which also affect cybersecurity and the different VDA books. And of course, also common mistakes that will are done all the time, depending on the product or the project or the company. And to combine all that and to see, okay, where you are regarding these different aspects, that's something we want to achieve with that approach. And maybe at the end, very shortly, how to get there. So that's quite easy with starting an NDA, aligning on the scope. So what is important for you, see which kind of work products are needed, starting with a short review of them, aligning open points to clarify what is understanding. So not saying, okay, everything is bad, to understand what was the background, what was the history, to get a report including the findings and possible countermeasures and discuss that with you so that you are able to see where we are, where you are, and what is the right way you need to go to keep efficient, to reach your project goals and your company goals, but also to be prepared for the future for all the new standards and all the new challenges related to cybersecurity. And what we can definitely guarantee with that, you get more awareness about cybersecurity in your company. You get your strengths and the weaknesses because not everything is bad and a lot of things can be reused. And 
do you understand then the impact? Okay, how things are changing now due to these newer regulations? And also to see, okay, what is the right level of investment? What we saw also from competitors, they want to start everything from scratch and say, okay, everything you did before is not good enough, but that's actually not true. So a lot of things can be reused and cybersecurity does not reinvent the wheel. There are things that need to be added. There are things that need to be improved, but it's not an argument to start everything from scratch. And based on that, to be able to develop a process to see how to reach a your final target by continuously improving your work. So that's it actually from my side for our gap analysis. But before closing, since we have a high number of participants where we are also quite surprised and a lot of feedback in front of the call or in front of the meeting, we have also a short surprise for you. So if you need to learn more about cybersecurity, we can definitely recommend you our one day virtual live training, where we also train more than 100 people already this year. So it's not an, just me standing in front of a camera and talking, it's an interactive training to provide you the content the best way and then the most interesting way. And you, as participants of our first webinar, we would like to offer you then also 30% here. So just copy the voucher code, co voucher code sorry for that and insert it if you're interested and get a good discount here. And last but not least, I just want again, because I'm quite proud of it, uh, mention our cybersecurity book, which will be available in the middle of May, which covers um, the experience of the last years from me and my whole team, but aren't. So that's it actually from the content so far. And I see that we got some questions which I would like to answer. So we have a few minutes time for questions. Also feel free to write in the chat further questions. Uh, we have still a few minutes to answer them. And, but let me start with the first one. So the first one is question if the webinar is recorded to share it with colleagues. So that I will check with my marketing team, but I don't think that it will be any problems. So, we are open to share that. Just contact me afterward, afterwards via email or also via phone and we can provide you the material. That's no problem at all. Another question. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Actually, what is the, what if what if there is a conflict between function and safe function and safety and cybersecurity? And is it even possible? First, yes, it is possible. A quite simple example. One typical measure for cybersecurity is encryption. Encryption needs computing power. But for function safety, sometimes you have very extreme timing limitations that you need, you need to react in a few milliseconds, thinking about an airbag, for example. And of course, in that case, this function safety and cybersecurity requirements could be contradicting. Actually, there's no no hands-on solution for how to say what is now more important is it cybersecurity is it functional safety um i would answer the question in that direction so if we think about maybe let me share and it's a bit easier to explain if we think about the scope of function safety and of cybersecurity function uh, safety and the evaluation and the tara that about the worst case is, as the name says it, it's safety. Protecting people, protecting people from getting harmed or avoid that people die. If we look into the threat analysis and risk assessment to identify the technical risks from a cybersecurity point of view, yeah, then first, of course, we also need to take safety into account, but the 21434 also requires an evaluation regarding your finance impact, the operation, operational impact, so is the product still working, and the impact on privacy. And seeing that, on the one hand, you see cybersecurity might be more complex than functional safety, or we need to 
take more dimensions into account. Um, but coming back to your question, I would answer it in that way. If you have a conflict between both, my approach would be to go one step deeper and having a look where is the requirement coming from, especially your cybersecurity requirement. If your cybersecurity requirement is based mainly on the financial impact and it's contradicting with your cybersecurity, uh, with your functional safety requirement, yeah, then I would say, of course, the life of human people is always more important than any financial impact. And that will be an argumentation in this cybersecurity case nobody can argument against. Same for operational, and I would also same, say same for privacy. If that is for me one case, oops, up. the second case, if your safety requirement is contradiction, contradicting with your cybersecurity requirement, and your cybersecurity requirement is also based on a safety evaluation. First of all, I would say this can happen, but it's a quite rare scenario. But if that is the case, then do you need to look deeper into your Tara and into your Hara and to see how that specific scenario was evaluated. Because, and that's a good thing, usually from a safety point of view, the fact or from the safety evaluation, the 26262 and the 21434, they're using the same criteria. And then you can evaluate, okay, which ones are the higher risks or the higher um worst case impact so when we have an assumption of safety also touch on product liability and where the difference actually there's no difference the product liability law says that you need to develop state of the art and of course you need to have evidences for that so that you are as a person are not liable and state of the art or minimum minimum requirements for state of the art is provided by ISO standards. ISO standards are defined as a consensus of the society because all companies from a, different, from a specific industry are able to contribute. And missing compliance to a standard could result in that if something happens, you are not working to working to according to state of the art. But the argumentation in the end to follow the standards is exactly the same for functional safety and for cybersecurity. Um, the next one, is it only for OEM and or supplier too? Of course, it's for both. Um, to elaborate a little bit on that, of course, the UNR 155 is targeting OEMs. That's clearly defined and clearly in their scope. But there's a dedicated requirement inside that the OEMs are responsible to ensure cybersecurity along the whole supply chain. And actually what is happening right now, all car manufacturers insert a requirement in their specification, this supplier shall be compliant to UNR 155. So therefore also they need to ensure that they have the processes in place which are compliant to the UN regulation. And the 21434 is applicable for all areas anyway. And in the same way, also our gap analysis is applicable for OEM, for tier one suppliers, and we are also in discussion with tier two suppliers, because in the end, they also need to provide compliance on the one hand, and they need to know which way to go there, where they are, and what are the right measures. So the next one. Is previous experience in 26262 beneficial for 21434? Um, I have to say yes, because I'm from the functional safety area originally, so I started my career there, but I think it is definitely beneficial. On the one hand, if you are used to work according to a standard, to interpret a standard, to find argumentate the right argumentations that you're compliant to a standard, um, that helps, this experience helps you definitely for cybersecurity. Also, the standards have a similar structure and a similar 
thinking behind. But, and that is also a common misunderstanding, that does not mean that each function safety engineer or manager can easily be a cybersecurity manager. Because the 21434 is completely open in any methods. It just defines what you have to do and not how to reach it. And how to reach it, there you can't take really any beneficial uh, or any any knowledge, previous knowledge from functional safety. So it helps you in finding the right way to be compliant, but it does not give you a hands-on. So I would say it helps you, but it's not a guarantee that you're able to work compliant to cybersecurity. And the next one, cool, it's really great having a lot of questions here. Is there a gap analysis that compares 262262 uh, and 21434? And this would help a lot to know uh, how to include the relevant differences into our project development processes. Um, there is, we, may, we, had an, we made an analysis internally to see, okay, where are the overlaps and where are the differences? Um, let me say it in that way. There's nothing from functional safety which can be 100% reused for cybersecurity. There are similar approaches like the item definition, collecting all relevant information on the one hand related to cybersecurity or on the other hand related to functional safety. And of course, this could be the same document, but still you need to look at that from a different point of view. You also have a usual way, way of working as it is done in cybersecurity and in systems engineering, deriving your requirements, your architecture on different levels and verifying and integrating that. So also here, functional safety has its input and cybersecurity has its input. Or as a last example, the distributed development, the DIA, also here it's a similar procedure, but also here there are differences because from a cybersecurity point of view, the phases after start of production are more and more important and more and more serious. And since this comparison, functional safety and cybersecurity are always a question, let me give you a short illustration to, uh, about how the level of risks might be different between both standards. So if we look at this graph, we have a timeline and we have here our, our risk level, our level of risk. And of course, somewhere there's a threshold that we want to reach. So if we look at functional safety, and maybe let me add here, our start of production. For functional safety, we at the beginning of the development, we are identifying the risk, deriving our requirements, bringing safety measures in all different levels of the development so that we are for start of production below our risk level, our risk threshold. They may say, okay, here it is acceptable. And then if we did a good job, if we do all our analysis, we closed all open points, then this risk level stays usually the same. All random hardware failures are already considered and all systematic failures are avoided. If we look now from a cybersecurity point of view, we have here a similar procedure. We have identified risk, we had added different kinds of measures, and for start of production, we are below our risk threshold. But as you know it from smartphones, from your laptops, risk is evolving and technology is changing. The amount of information a hacker uh, on hacking organization might have can also increase over time. So the overall risk of a hack of an incident, that is again increasing over the time. And that's something we always need to take into account when we compare functional safety with cybersecurity. This whole area here, after the start of production, so for production, for logistic, for operation, needs a higher attention for cybersecurity than for functional safety.
So I think we can answer a few more questions. Five minutes we left. Um, how supplier should manage UNR in 21.4 before since the standards and regulations have been written from point of view of the OEMs? Um, that statement is only partially true. The 21 in the working group of the 21.4 before, at least in Germany and the European countries, also tier ones and also tier twos are participating and contributing. And we are Cyrus, as a consulting company, we are also contributing and we are part of this working groups. So the 21434 is not only written from an OEM point of view. It's a combined work between OEMs, tier one suppliers, even tier two suppliers, and even further uh, representatives from the industry. The UNR155, I partly agree. Yes, it was driven by the OEMs, but there's also the European Society of Suppliers who, re who reviewed that document and who needed to approve that document. So also here, the supplier point of view was considered. So I agree it's mainly, oh, and it's driven by the OEMs, but the supplier had all the time the possibility to recheck and to bring their own proposals. And so therefore, it is maybe more challenging for the supplier based on the time and the money pressure without any questions. But in the end, they had enough chances to argument against it or to contribute in the whole development work. And when... So for the quest, next question, input on cybersecurity on the marine industry, class industry, uh, class society, I would skip that question. You can contact me afterwards because I think main of our participants are from the automotive industry. Um, so is 21434 necessary for a supplier to achieve in 26262 so compliance has already been achieved? Yes, it's two different point of views completely. You need you have in the 26262 an audit and assessment and in the 21434 an audit and assessment and you need to be have both and both are from different point of views and both are also checking different kind of work products. The intention in both is the same. There are some differences but I don't want to go into detail. Uh, the audit is more for the processes, the assessment is more for the technical solutions but it's two different standards and you need to be compliant to both of them. Of course, it can be combined in one assessment session, but you need for both a report and you need for both in the end a certification or a confirmation that you pass that. And then let me go to the next one. Uh, da, 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 da. So for example, the OEM say do fast testing, but does not know what fast, what fast testing to use? So how does the supplier meet cybersecurity requirements of the OEM managed dependencies? Um, so maybe let me explain it on the example of penetration testing. In the end, it's similar. The standard says the 21 falls before you need to apply penetration testing on vehicle level, which means for the OEMs. And almost all OEMs, again, put that in their specification and say, okay, you need to apply cybersecurity, uh, you need to apply penetration testing as a supplier. Um, if there are different point of views, and that also we see that sometimes there are requirements and nobody knows exactly how to interpret them and not even the OEM, the only solution is talking to each other. And if you say in your context, fast testing might not be the right approach, talk together and, and think about, okay, what might be a better approach? The standard does, especially as a supplier, not force you to do dedicated methods. That's up to you. But it's important that you have an argumentation why the combination of methods you choose is the right one to ensure a secure product in the end. But what we saw in the end, based on communication, a lot of problems can be solved between OEM and supplier. And if you have that alignment, then put it in the DAA and make it fix and let it be signed by both parties. And then we have 
a software supplier to automotive industry, we are supposed to implement the CSMS and get audited by accredited party or only implement CMMS to be aligned with the automotive customer expectations without audit. Um, as a software, so, so let's let's distinguish here between the 21434 and the UNR regulation. The UNR regulation, you will not be audited by any uh, official party because that will be done by the OEM. What can happen is, of course, that the OEM will audit you based on their requirements or based or that they check that you are fulfilled the UNR because they are responsible in the end. But you will not be uh, evaluated by any accredited party. For the 21434, it looks a bit different because you are part of the development. So you need to apply the 21434 based on your context. Of course, some parts can be tailored, like the whole concept phase, the whole Tara, but for your scope, you get be ordered, you need to have an audit and an assessment. But that does not need to be done by an accredited party. It can be done, that's also specified in the standard, even internally, or you can do it externally. Important is only, again, that you have a good argumentation, that the level of depend independency you choose um, was good enough. But this can be done yeah, by any, any independent party in the end. But here you need, in the end, for your cybersecurity case, an evidence that this audit and assessment have been taking place. So always be careful here between 21434 and the UNR 155. So we are a bit over time. Let's take two more questions. Um, so next question, who will dictate what to do in 21434 or in the UNEC or in the UNR 155? So the target, we should always keep in mind what is the target? What is the purpose behind? The purpose is to have a secure product. And usually they are distributed developments, meaning different parties with a customer supplier constellation working jointly on the same target and the same development. But of course, one is on a higher level, one is supporting them from a lower level. And who needs to do what? Yeah, that needs to be defined between both parties. And herefore, the development interface agreement is the work product that is required by the standard and that needs to be filled to have an aligned understanding between that. For some work products, there might not be a right or wrong. So that depends on the different technical context and also on the project circumstances, but it must be aligned in a document. And therefore, the DIA, as known from function and safety, is that thing that needs to be filled and needs to be taken into account. And then we have for cybersecurity responsibility, what kind of background he must have. Um, so the standard says you need to have the right competence and awareness to fulfill your cybersecurity related tasks. Um, in the end, it depends. Also again here, are you responsible from a technical point of view? Are you responsible for cybersecurity in the product or even on company level? Or maybe you only a part of all of that. So it cannot be answered individually because each role needs different competences and different awareness. So it, in the end, it depends, but what is important, if you have responsibility, you need to be able to argument all your decisions. That's the key thing. Why you think that is the right way, that is enough, and you need evidences for that. And for that, you need to feel comfortable. And that's, in the end, the level of experience you need. So let's take one last question. Um, oh, that's good. Is quality management system knowledge beneficial for implementing the 21434? That's a good question for closing. Um, the 21434 has one requirement regarding quality management system, and it states quality management system needs to be in place. Quite simple. Uh, the 26262 is a bit more specific, but there in the chapter eight, there are different kind of different kind of uh, requirements for document management, requirements management, etc. Coming to your question, from our point of view. A proper quality management system is the foundation, the basic you need to have to be able to develop secure products. Because without having a good quality, without knowing how to write requirements, without having a proper documentation, 
how do you want to put cybersecurity on top? And that's also one thing which, which we experience in almost all of our projects. The biggest challenge is not always cybersecurity. It's not to do how to do a Tara, how to select the right controls. The biggest challenge in many cases is missing experience in quality management systems and sometimes also an insufficient or missing understanding of engineering quality. That things are done in the right way, are documented in the right way, are checked in the right way, so that actually everything is known, everything is documented, everything is available, people can work with, know what to do, and then we can add some specific cybersecurity analysis, cybersecurity requirements, cybersecurity measures. But imagine you define cybersecurity requirements, you ensure the implementation, but for all the rest of the functionality, nothing is really defined or nobody knows what to do. How can you guarantee in the end that your product is secure? Or how can the product even work? And we had one constellation with a client. They worked with another company, great people, great technical knowledge, but they did not even wrote a requirement before. And how do you now then want to be compliant with a new standard? So that's a lot of challenge, a lot of work and a huge challenge and therefore a proper quality management system, for example, according to automotive spies, according to CMMI, or at least taking the IATF into account, that helps you a lot and yeah, saves you a lot of efforts in terms of cybersecurity in the end. So for all other questions, so we are already eight minutes over time. It's great to see all the contribution here. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, contact me, write me an email. We definitely, I definitely come back to you and provide you proper answers. Also feel free to contact us for feedback for this session. So in case it helped to you, we definitely will set up more of them for different topics all around cybersecurity. Maybe we can also pick some dedicated topics from our training and give you a short introduction in specific areas. So thanks again for this high number of participants and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. Thanks, goodbye.